It's time for us to review the fundamental concepts of the most important routing protocol ever created. Okay, just kidding. But we are going to review the key concepts behind Routing Information Protocol, or RIP, version 2, in this particular nugget. Now, a lot of people like to say that RIP is completely lame, and I always point out, well, you're probably referencing RIP version 1. I mean, that was the lamest of the lame. The biggest problem with RIP version 1 was the fact that it was indeed a classful routing protocol. This meant that RIP version 1 would not send, believe it or not, it would not send subnet mask information in its updates. This meant that you could not engage in variable length subnet masking. So RIP version 1, definitely more on the pathetic side. A lot of the things that we're going to talk about in this concepts review are indeed enhancements to RIP version 1 thanks to the creation of RIP version 2. But alas, we begin our concept review by discussing the metric of RIP version 2 and this metric is still frowned upon. Why? Because the metric is indeed still hop count. And the big issue there is it makes absolutely no consideration of bandwidth when it is choosing a best path through the network infrastructure. The hop count begins at zero for a directly connected network and moves up to a maximum of 16. 16 indicates the network is unreachable. So I guess you could really consider the maximum metric as 15. In fact, you'd want to be really careful about that in an exam environment to make sure you read very carefully. The maximum's 15, 16 is considered unreachable, so you'd want to read very, very carefully when making a choice like that in an exam environment. This particular hop count is something that I'd like to see at the command line. For a lot of these different concept reviews, we'll verify that we fully understand it by analyzing the protocol at the command line. So I'm sure you're not surprised for our command line work. We will turn to GNS3, and this is a five router topology. And this network right here is the 12, 12, 12 network. That's the network between router R1 and R2, Thus, my identifier there of the 12 network. Well, let's go and take a look at this network as it is learned on R3. What would we expect? Well, this network is advertised to R3 from R2, and this network exists on R2 and moves one hop away. So this network should indicate one hop. So we should expect to see a hop count of one on R3. This is sent to R4. We would expect to see a hop count for this network of R of 12, 12, 12 on R4 of two. Let's see if that's the case. So here we are on R3 with our show IP route command. And here we can see the 12 network. And sure enough, on R3, it is one hop away as we expected. Something that's pretty troubling, though, is the fact that we had a network of 12, 12, 12, and we can see that it has been automatically summarized by RIP to 12, 0, 0, 0. So we'll have more to say on that, obviously, later on in upcoming videos, but that is problematic. Now, uh, potentially problematic. Next up is R4. On R4, yes, indeed, we have the RIP route for the 12 network, and just as we expected, the metric is indeed a hop count of two at this point in the overall network. And we're reminded here of RIP's true distance vector, you know, principle, right? It's built as a true distance vector protocol. There is a distance given in hop count, and then there's a vector, a direction. And that is, hey, head towards the gigabit one slash zero interface in order to get traffic to that destination. Remember, we are routing by rumor here with our distance vector routing protocol, something we really don't care for much. This device says, okay, I know how to get to a particular network location. It gives that information to this device. This device 
believes that information and then forwards it to this device, which believes that information and forwards it out. We are not building our own pictures of the topology. We are not building our own routing information. We are relying upon the information given to us by a neighbor. This is why we need so many loop prevention mechanisms in a distance vector routing protocol because of the proliferation of bad information that could easily take place. By the way, this totally reminds me of a game that I played in elementary school. The teacher got all 30 of us in a circle. She went and whispered something to the first student. That student whispered it to the next student. That student whispered it to the next student. By the time it made it through all 30 of us in the ring and the last person said what the statement was, it was completely and totally unrelated to the original statement. Yeah, it had been modified and modified in transit, bad information propagating further and further, just like we could have in the distance vector environment. Now, apparently, according to our documentation, RIP version 2 will utilize a broadcast approach of UDP packet information in order to propagate the updates. All right, well, let me test this in our topology. Here we can see that on R4 with our show IP route, we know we're learning a RIP route, in fact, a couple of them, through the gigabit 1 slash 0 interface. We're learning about the 12 network and the 23 network. That's the network between R1 and R2 and R2 and R3. I've only enabled RIP right now on R1, R2, R3, and R4 in our big topology. Okay, anyways, so we know we're learning this RIP information from that particular interface. Look what I did. I created an IP access list extended called Stop RIP. It denies UDP traffic and then permits all the IP traffic. So this should certainly stop RIP if it is truly UDP based. I put this inbound on gigabit 1 slash 0. So what we'll do now is we will clear the routing table, clear IP route asterisk. And we'll do a show IP route and the RIP routes are gone. I'll go ahead and wait some duration of time, specifically longer than 30 seconds, because that's the advertisement interval for RIP. And we'll see if the RIP routes show up. Suppose what I really should have done was added a log entry to this statement right here. And then we would see those particular updates being logged right at the console as they're hitting this access list. As a matter of fact, here's another thing we can do. Show IP access list. Whoops. Get that typing right. And look at this. Yes, indeed. It's stopping rip, and there's our proof. We can see the matches against that line in the access list. One more show IP route shows that, yes, indeed, we have killed off the UDP-based rip. As you just heard me mention, it is indeed a 30-second advertisement interval. And this is, again, where RIP tends to be frowned upon. It is considered a very chatty protocol. Think about it. There is absolutely no topology changes taking place, and RIP is going to advertise what it knows to its neighboring router every 30 seconds. Every 30 seconds, yes, even though there's been no change. By the way, should there be a topology change, that will trigger an update. But, but the really troubling thing is, if there is no update at all to report, it reports anyways. Yikes. By the way, how long is information kept in the tables by default? Well, let's say your router, let's say it's router 3, stops hearing about a particular network. RIP, by default, will wait 180 seconds before it marks that network as unreachable. If it doesn't hear from its neighbor for 240 seconds, it will consider all of the routes from that neighbor as invalid. So there are some flush timers, as we like to call them, that is governing the behavior of RIP. And notice these are very lengthy periods of time, aren't they, in today's technology you know, in today's converged network environments, when you th see something like 240 seconds, that really does seem like an eternity. So there's version two that we deal with, and then there's also a version one of RIP floating around out there.
What if you're running version two, what, what, what happens as far as version one compatibility? Well, when we enable version two on our device, let's say it's R1, we will be, as you might expect, sending version two updates, but we do have the ability to receive both version one and version two on that particular interface. Again, something we would definitely want to verify. So on R1, I have run a show IP protocol and we see that we're running RIP and then we see something rather embarrassing. We are sending version one and we are able to receive on this interface version one and version two. Wow, so we are not running version two of RIP. How embarrassing. So I say router RIP and then I would guess it's as easy as saying version 2. We'll now take a look at our show IP protocols output and look at this. We're going to send version 2 and receive version 2. So what we read in the documentation isn't necessarily true for this particular operating system. We won't receive version 1 and version 2 traffic by default. Could we control this? Can this be controlled? I would think the answer is yes. Let's check it out. Interface gigabit one slash zero IP rip receive. And then we can say version and then we get version one or version two. Let's see if you can put both in there. Yeah. So you could say IP rip receive version one, two. And we'd confirm this, of course, with show IP protocols. And now we have configured what is the default for some systems, and that's send version 2 now, receive version 1 or 2. And if you want to see the updates that are coming in, you can do debug IP RIP. So we'll just sit here for a moment, and we can see the version 2 update that we are sending regarding these networks. And we are neighboring R2 that is speaking version 1 of RIP still. So let's see. Wait long enough here at the command line due to the chatty nature of RIP. And we should see a version 1 update come in from our neighbor. So there we were sending some updates again. Still haven't received an update. Oh, wait a minute. There it is. It was right in front of me. I just didn't see it. There it is. Received a version one update from our neighbor R2. And we got these particular network destinations. And notice the metric hops that were in those particular updates. Now, another nice enhancement with version two of RIP is your ability to do authentication. If you're not interested in security, you could do plain text authentication between the RIP devices. This is like to guard against misconfiguration and is not considered a security mechanism. If you're interested in security, you would do MD5 authentication between like R1 and R2 for the version 2 packets that they are sending back and forth. Variable length subnet masking we know is possible with version 2 as we discussed thanks to subnet mask information being sent with updates and we're going to see there are lots of loop prevention mechanisms we might bump up against a big one being split horizon. Let's say we have some type of WAN technology and we've got a hub and spoke interface that we've built. Let's say this is interface gigabit 1/0. Updates are coming in to that interface and in the hub and spoke topology and they would be prevented from going out that interface thanks to the split horizon loop prevention mechanism. So with RIP, lots to be concerned about, including loop prevention mechanisms causing our topology grief. And obviously we will have nuggets here at CBT Nuggets dealing with all of these very important topics in greater detail. But in this particular nugget, our job was just to kind of refresh ourselves on the concepts behind RIP version 2. It may be quite some time that you have dealt with such a completely non-scalable routing protocol. So this was just a bit of a primer, if you will, on RIP so that we can really dig in to these concepts and the behaviors of RIP in much greater detail 
in later nuggets. I sure hope this nugget was informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.